Hello, everybody. Welcome back. TLDC Summer Community Day. We're talking about career development and our day's almost over. We've got, uh, this is the um, the second to the last session. And um, I am really, really excited about this one because Rubina is leading this talk with her surprise guest, Kitsal, who if uh, you don't know Kitsal, you should. He is one of the more talented people that I know, especially like on the audio video side of things. He is quietly um, an incredible like expert guru type. Uh, anyway, that's a whole other conversation. But with today's session, um, how to backwards design your resume, Rubina has been helping people with uh, their L&D careers for a while now. It's been years and I see you on LinkedIn, constantly posting about this type of thing. You even have a table out in the lounge area where you're willing to meet with folks one-on-one -on -one to talk about resumes. And um, somehow she roped in Quetzal to um, be a part of this session here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hide myself and let the two of you uh, introduce yourselves and, and talk a little bit about your L&D journeys. And, um, and maybe with that, um, let's start with Quetzal. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> I already see we're going to start getting these puns in here. I want to see some really good ones. All right. I am Quetzal Cortez. I am a instructional designer slash learning experience designer slash e-learning developer slash filling your own sort of <laughs> learning and development title. Um, I've been in the field for oh, about 10 plus years. Uh, Spent a good chunk of my time out in the Bay Area, but uh, most recently I am coming to you live from Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, but you didn't come here for me. You came for the woman of the hour. So go ahead and Rubina, introduce yourself. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. I was about to say good morning. Goodness. Um, uh, I'm out in Salt Lake City, Utah. I'm an instructional designer here uh, for the state and plus, 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 very similar to Q's background as well. Um, I've been in L&D for at least 10 years and then in education as a whole for about 20 years. And so the discussion that I've got for you guys today is really pulling from 20 years of knowledge, experience, crapshoot experience, failure, success, all sorts of things wrapped into one. Um, and hopefully this is a nice talk for you guys. And the reason why Q is in this room right now, um, this started off organically right here, right today, this morning. Um, I was over in the lounge and just hanging out and preparing a presentation for you. Um, Q stepped in and was like, hey, so what are you talking about? And <laughs> uh, we, 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 we got into this really, really good discussion. And then I go, well, wait a minute. That's really my presentation, essentially. Um, and so I just we, we put heads together and then um, decided to try this format. Um, and we pulled it together in about, uh, two hours. So love it or hate it. That's where it is. Anyway, um, to start off, I just wanted to ask Q to reiterate what we talked about this morning. He was telling about his experience writing resumes. And so if you could just share what that is like for you, how do you build your resume for instructional design jobs? Thanks. Well, I could tell you that like usually when it comes time for me to, to write a resume, I am neither prepared nor like ready to write one. Um, I got laid off twice and, you know, I've had times where I'm just, just having these career decisions and I want to move on to something else, but I'm not quite sure. So um, usually what happens is I'm either like rehashing an existing resume that I have or I'm asking somebody else like, hey, can I um, borrow your resume? And I'm essentially just, just cribbing off of whatever they've written. You know, although I question like where they got their stuff from. So I'm pretty sure my hand-me-down has probably been a hand-me-down for many, many iterations previous. Awesome, awesome. Um, let me, I just put it in the chat. Let me know if this is something similar to the way you also write your resumes. You're like, oh my gosh, I either I'm looking for work, just lost work, um, trying for a career change, a, a couple of different reasons. But then you 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 open up your Word or you open up your Google, whatnot, and then you start charting it out. Um, that that is seemingly similar to a lot of people the way they write their resumes. 
Um, what I want to present to you a little bit different is to perhaps flip the way you write your resume. Don't start off by writing your resume first, essentially, um, and start with the job announcement. I'll tell you what to glean in there and then piece together your resume backwards from that if that makes sense. Um, and so let me get into some of this presentation stuff. Q, is there anything fun in the chat that I need to see before we start off? I think you're seeing a lot of uh, similar responses. Yep, they ask if there's an original resume left in this world. Um, there's some here looking for work at the resume is a mosaic of what other people have written or showed them. So it's, it's a quilt, a quilt yes. that is made yes. of people's <laughs> resumes. Um, and so here's why I'm using this model for us. Let me get into this here right now. So what is backwards design? Just to give you um, a, a quick overview of the model, just in case you might be new here and learning about instructional design models. And I just want to review it very quickly. Um, and if you're familiar with it, go ahead and give me a smiley or a thumbs up face um, in, the, in the chat just so I can fill you out. Yeah. Um, so backwards design very simply is just taking a um, methodology where you start off with your learner goals and then you use some evidence-based information, um, figure out what you're going to assess on to determine that level of understanding, and then build the instructional design product based on that formula. So you're starting with the end in mind and then building your way up to reach that end. So I'm using that model and segueing it from a little bit, probably in the second section here, just to kind of curtail it to a, to a resume. And I'll guide you through all of these little steps in just a second. But that's the basis of backwards design for instructional design, just in case you wanted to know. Um, so how do we apply this to a resume? I've got the framework over there. And you can pull up your resume too. I did ask for folks when you were coming into this, if they have their resume, um, show of smileys, give me some heart signs if you have your resume in front of you. Yay, one person, yay. Everybody else go scramble and get your resumes. Okay, awesome, I see some more hearts in there. Um, make sure that you are also taking notes from here and I will give you my PowerPoint presentation slides at the end of this. I'll make sure Lewis has it and, and, and shows it to everybody that came here. Um, but make some notes also if you if you need to. Before you start writing your resume, make sure you have your strategy outlined. Kind of just like writing an instructional design product, write out the strategy, write out the outline, write out, the, write out what you're going to put in based on your goal. Um, step one is to identify the goals of your job search. What are you trying to achieve with that job search? We'll step through that in just a second. Step through, step two, gather your evidence. And by evidence, I actually mean looking at the job announcements. And in a second, I'll step you through how to do that as well and what to look for. Um, step three, build a resume. That's it. It's three steps. It's very easy. Focus on your audience write to your audience the exact same way that you would be writing instructional design courses, e-learning courses, any anything that you're building in instructional design for whatever you know uh, specific role you have. You always have to figure out your audience and then write to that audience. So when you're writing to that audience, that takes some finesse, that takes some understanding, that takes some, you know, um, you need to key in on who's your audience and what you need to say in order for you to sell your content, right? It's the exact same way when you're writing your resume. Um, and then align what is in the job announcement to your resume. So instead of starting on that plain Word document and going forwards of what you did and how you learned how to write resumes from only, you know, from all sorts of places, LinkedIn and and all sorts of stuff that's out there, writing it this way will, has worked for me, has worked successfully for folks that I've given um, uh, a lot of job coaching for, um, a lot of resume help, and across the board, across fields. 
So this model actually does work to shorten the time frame that you are looking for work, really hone in on jobs that you want, and specifically to places that you want to work at. And I'll show you that in just a second. Um, and then how to align what you want to your end goal. And it will shorten the amount of downtime that you have in between jobs. I know that this works. This is a proven model for me that I've used, that I've also given lots and lots over the years. Um, um, a lot of uh, resumes that I've written for people and that I've coached people to write their own resumes based on the stuff that I presented here too. So it definitely does work. Um, any questions before we go on to yeah, I got, a, I got a question for you. So when I look at my own LinkedIn, it has everything kind of set up, like almost like in a, what I would consider like a resume format. Why can't I just kind of copy out what I see on my LinkedIn resume and kind of paste it in? Because you already have like everything in your kind of chronological order sort of layout. There's already kind of a summary there. Um, can I just use that as like my baseline to get a resume started? Really good question. And the answer is it depends. It depends who's going to read it. And I actually think the way that LinkedIn has their format for resume is old, archaic, broken, perhaps not the best model in today's modern world where employers want to see things very quickly. Um, and when they're gleaning through the LinkedIn resume or the, you know, if you hit here, print, save, save a copy of this resume. And if anybody's ever done that, you could just put some smileys if you've ever actually gotten a, a layout of your resume. It just looks awful. Um, and so I end up never sharing that to employers because it just looks awful. And so LinkedIn created that resume template that's been around since probably the origination of LinkedIn. And so I think it's just old, out of date, not what I want to present here. Um, and it's what the folks at LinkedIn thought you needed to have in your resume, but they're not really then telling you how to connect what you've done to the job announcement. That's where the gap is. And so if you identify that gap and then just try to fill that in, just like an instructional design process, um, you can totally perfect writing your resume. You as an instructional designer already have all the skills you need to make your resume work for you superbly. Half and half is content. The other half is your layout, what you've done, and then how are you presenting what you've done? I hope that okay. clears that up. Awesome. So yeah, I, I really wouldn't use it. Um, step one, let's just go through this really quickly. And I don't even have a lot of slides. The one thing I don't do to you is given a lot of slides, I make about 10 slides at the most in any presentation I've ever done. So we're, we're already halfway through this. Just bear with me. Um, I, I'm more concerned about you guys understanding the process and then ask me questions about it. Just go ahead, put some questions in the Q&A that you may have also. Um, about this and then go off with the knowledge and then go be and do what you need to do to your own resume. So um, I got a question for you, Rubina. Yeah, um, yeah. Like, okay, so I've been in positions where I've just, I've just been stuck in a rut. I want to look for another job. Um, I'm still not quite sure what I, uh, what I was in, but I have like skill sets from various areas, from project management, video editing, mm -hmm. you know, e-learning development, um, you know, like, like I've done agile scrum sort of uh, methodology in previous works and so forth. I'm, you know, I, I'm worried that I might be leaving some things out. And so maybe it makes more sense for me to make kind of like a, you know, like a, like a Swiss army knife sort of resume. Um, where does that kind of work in in the case of how you're you're talking about backwards design? Is it something that yeah. I need to like have several ones kind of created, or um, 
what are your thoughts? Just, yeah. Okay. So really, really good question, right? Instructional designers. One, one thing that we get stuck with a lot is that master, what is it? Uh, knowledge of all or whatever master of none kind of thing. We wear multiple hats and stuff. Word choice is very important. Succinct word choice based on keywords that you see in the job announcement and then working your way backwards to make sure that you show that in your resume. And that's what this model is designed to do to teach you to do. You look at the job announcement, you're figuring out those key elements that you need to keep in mind. And for the end goal here, just to tie this in, is that am I using that to get the job? No, we're not using this to get the job yet because you're not there yet. The only goal that I want you to have when you're writing your resume is to get past the AI. I'll show you in a minute exactly how, how you can do that. Um, get to the hiring manager to pick up your specific resume and read your specific resume for the job, differentiating yourself from the rest of the folks that are also applying in that applicant pool. Um, and then hopefully getting a call for an interview. This is a very limited scope of what this thing is, is designed to do. There are other tips and strategies that I can offer to you guys about these other little elements and stuff. Should you make more than one resume, perhaps, but at least if you've gotten an understanding of how to build a resume, and then from there you can splinter off if there's a different job, tweak it, and then if there's a different um, type of job that you want to have, like switching a career, then you then you use this model for that application, if that makes sense. Okay. Hey, uh, Christine has a question here. How do we uh, overcome the feeling of having to overcompensate when tailoring our resumes to the job description? What do you mean by overcompensate? Uh, maybe trying to feel, try, trying to do your best to match maybe the job descri description like precisely to make sure that you're not like missing any sort of holes. I assume that's what you're referring to, Christine? Yeah, I get into that too. And if that's it, then, you know, you can just type in yes. Um, so, you know, based on my understanding of that, yes, you can definitely have your resume, put in definitely what you need. Um, from there, you may want to shift it around, given another job announcement, and then adding a couple of things in. Not everything, and never lie. Um, always support what you're saying with specific examples for that, if you need to show that. So that goes into more of like how to specifically curate an individual resume for a specific job. But for most jobs out there that you're applying for, you can have a generic instructional design resume that says the in generic instructional design pieces and elements that you have to have. Um, you have to know adult learning theory. Go ahead and put in the chat, what are the must haves in an instructional design resume skill wise? Those will always remain the same. Just use that as an example. You have to have adult learning theory. You have to have an understanding of working with the SME. You have to have some key elements in there that are always going to be in your resume. Don't ever leave that out. Then on top of that, put in what really hones you in for a specific job that you are uniquely qualified for, for instance. Let's say I'm applying for instructional design position in medicine and they're, they're creating healthcare training and I have healthcare certification courses um, knowing about certain terminology or um, um, I've taken related uh, projects that have been in the healthcare realm. So I wanna identify myself and that's a niche thing for you to do is to say, I have health care instructional design experience. That makes you get picked up by somebody more than the next person. And that's how you differentiate yourself a little bit from there. So there are some basics that you do have to have just like everybody else to show that you are 
aptly qualified, right? You have to get through that AI or whatever we're, I mean, we're, I'm just calling it AI, but whatever that robot or that machine or the imaginary machine, if there's an imaginary machine, I'm not sure. Um, sometimes like, oh my gosh, my resume didn't get picked up, you know? And then don't ever worry about your resume not getting picked up. Apply for as many jobs as it takes. It doesn't matter. The right job will come to you at the right time, at the right place. Like there's some things that you can control. There's always going to be things that you can't. So just kind of keep that in mind. The right job will come along in the right way at the right place that matches you plus your employer to you. The, the, it'll be like an attraction of like to like what they posted out there. Did you read it? Did you write to it? Did you respond to it? And if it is, was it also something that you obviously love and interested in and that you really wanted? When those two come together, hopefully you'll get picked up for the interview and then move on from there in the negotiation, the offer and all of that other stuff. So I think uh, she was able to elaborate and uh, her words were, uh, you know, a job that has two years of experience in teaching when you have sporadic ones. Uh, a lot of us in the field refer to that as the fake it till you make it way of uh, filling yeah. out your resume. What are your thoughts on do, doing that? I have thoughts specifically on the, like the tool specific stuff, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on that particular piece. Cool question. Um, yeah, been there, done that. And, and here's the recipe for that. Um, put it on there. You can totally put on the year that you worked on it and then call it a project if it wasn't like a full-time, you know, 40-hour gig. Um, people want to see that you have the experience, that you know what you're doing, and they want some idea of time duration. And then you got to let them decide for themselves, is that enough time for you to be picked up for this job experience or not present whatever you have, the right person will read it in the right way. And don't worry so much about the little details. And I could definitely meet up with you guys one-on-one -on -one after this. Let me finish up what I have here, get some notes in and then go from there. And, and I'm happy to help out. Um, so step two, you got your goal. You just want your resume in their hand, then the phone to, pick up to call you. That's all you're trying to do. So in order for that to happen, look at the job announcement. Okay. What is in the job announcement? All a bunch of stuff. And then this job announcement was pages long, just so you know. And a lot of them are like that. So then you need to figure out what do you glean into the specific job announcement? What is it that instructional designers should have in their resume? That should also be in the job announcement. And I'm telling you now, if it's not in the job announcement, the person that's writing the announcement probably doesn't know anything about instructional design. If you know that the stuff isn't in there, I would steer clear from applying for that job because we've all been through that experience um, of, of, of like, what the heck is this? This doesn't make any sense. Why are they trying to do this and that job? That's not instructional design. It probably isn't. Chuck it. Move on. Look at this one. This is a standard standard format job announcement, right? And all of these will differ a little bit, but here are some of the must-haves you've got to have in this one. Um, instructional designer responsible for working collaboratively with subject matter experts. That's always par for the course. Um, and with some stakeholders, par for the course. Um, and giving some kind of high quality, of course, who's going to ever do low quality, like whatever. Um, high quality learning experiences, right? Um, okay, so then you look at that job and you're like, oh my gosh, I've got to have this job. It's the perfect job for me. Um, well, then you look at the duties and then you say, um, and then you see, you know, design online learning experiences, check. Okay, great. Uh, collaborating with stakeholders, if you've got experience, check. Put that stuff in your resume, in your skills, in past work in your core competencies. So that's where that stuff goes, those keywords. These keywords will get you through that robot AI and also at the face front of the hiring manager we help. Um, design high quality valid assessments. Of course, there's gonna be some kind of assessment in instructional design. Why would you do instructional design without assessing? Um, so make sure that is 
something that you are putting in your resume. Um, manage your project timelines. Instructional design is, is always going to have, no matter what job it is, people are going to have this expectation that you can manage your time. And if you can, it's a bonus and they're happy. And if you know how to do it, put it in there. Um, project management skills, time management skills, whatever it is. Um, and apply your instructional design skills to relevant learning theories. Again, adult learning theories, learning theories, they're called sometimes different things, but it's all about the same. Um, and then know, know some technologies like, like you know, LMS and whatnot. Um, qualifications for this one, some kind of bachelor's degree at least, um, and, and some knowledge of a learning management system. This is pretty par for the course. Um, and then they say, please have 10 years of experience like they always do, so that, that always happens. Um, and then you apply for it anyway. So before we continue on, any other, oh yeah, let me check out the poll here. Please make sure you answer the poll if you have, if you're looking for work, yes. A lot of people are looking for work. I'll put my information at the end of this. And if you have some time, sit with me in the lounge. If you don't have time at the end of this, I put in my information. We can set up a time to talk. Um, and that is perfectly fine for you guys, um, um, for us to do. And then is there any other questions in there, Q? Just let me know. Mm -hmm. We got a couple questions in here. Uh, just let me know. So uh, before I get to the questions, so are you suggesting that uh, um, just to get past the AI, we're doing a bit of like Mad Libs, like where we're kind of like locating certain yeah. key nouns and verbs that mm -hmm. I guess will will uh, satisfy that. So, I mean, what's to stop somebody from just designing the, the resume the way that they want and just like a Craigslist posting, just put all of that right at the bottom? Right. When you do that and you get called into the interview and they go, oh, please tell me a time where you did X, Y, and Z. And so if you can't support it, you're going to get, you know, kicked out or walked out or thank you and, and let's go. So don't ever put anything that doesn't match. Um, put everything that does match. And I've done it before where I have put it at the bottom. There are just some uh, places I knew in the federal government. I don't know if they do this now. I just, I knew that they did this years ago where you did have to have those keywords, the KSAs, um, you had to have that on your resume. So if that's all you need to do on your resume, just put in there whatever you've actually done and then let the employer decide from that point on to, to pick you up and make sure you can back it up with a response in your in your interview. So that's pretty much all you can so do. We got two questions here. Um, the first one is what template trends are being used these days? And uh, the other one refers to uh, some basic or generic ID elements like adult learning theory and working with SMEs. Uh, what are some other baseline things to include in an ID resume bef uh, before we worry about tailoring it? Um, so yeah, so I purposely am not, so as for template, you've got to construct it. You're the instructional designer. You're going to figure this out and I have the most faith in you. I can definitely show you a couple of examples and I will. Your specific person, your specific skill set, your specific experiences, your specific education, your specific time and place in working is going to be specific to you. So there is no one right way of writing a resume. There never ever will be and there should not. Let's say, for instance, you just got your PhD. Where do you want to put your PhD? At the absolute bottom? Well, no. If somebody needs your PhD as a bare minimum for an instructional design position, let's say in academic world, that happens a lot, and you just graduated with your PhD, you're going to put that up at the top. If you want your work experience to show, and the job application says you must have seven years of work experience, then you're going to put your work experience at the top showing seven year history, not the other way around, not any other way. You have got to tailor your resume to match the job announcement. That's all that matters. That's all that really matters. Um, I'm Can I do the voice? Can I do the voice? Go ahead. Go ahead. 
Shall we play a game? Thank you for picking up on that. Um, uh, anyway, uh, I, I, I don't know if any of these other younger folks, if they even remember that, but anyway, uh, we're gonna, we're gonna move on. So I don't date myself too much. Um, so say what you see, here's an example of a resume. Let me know in the chat what it is that you see based on just a couple of the things that I want you to leave out with and walking away knowing how to do. Um, did this job seeker, based on this presentation of a resume, write to the hiring manager? We saw a job announcement. We're now looking for those keywords, those key terms. Do you think, I want you to evaluate this resume based on what you think this presentation is. Can you tell that they wrote to the hiring manager of that previous job? Yes or no, maybe, I don't know. Let me know what you see and why. Um, and second question, and just in the chat as you have them, just as your thoughts come up, just put them in there. Does, the, does this job seeker align the job announcement with his resume? So did he write it to the audience? Um, and how do you know what are some key evidence? What are some key terms that you saw in that job announcement that you see here? Do you see it? What do you see? What works? What doesn't? Take a moment to kind of look at it. And I didn't put everything here in the resume. I just kind of put like this, this small summary piece um, and just so you're aware, some industry things, uh, a hiring manager will look at a resume for a good 15 to 30 seconds. And if you think they're ever going to get to page two, because you may have a page two thing. They never get to page two unless page one says what it needs to say. Page one really needs to write into that audience and it has to have the information in there. Otherwise, you're never going to get to it. page two. Well. Rene, would you mind jumping back to like slide five so people can see that job announcement? Yeah, let me do that. Um, and so what I'll have here is here's this job announcement. So if you write down some key terms, we're talking about um, building online learning experiences, collaborating with stakeholders and SMEs, managing project timelines, this is the part where you use Snagit to do the screen capture. I know. <laughs> um, and then learning theories. So let me get that in there. Hold on. Give me just All right. Everyone is taking their screen cap. Cool. <laughs> anyway, and, and, and we, we got a whole bunch. Everyone should have had their Snagit open because okay, that's the kind of crowd you have. I'm always trying to help out too anyway. So then now take a look, compare what you've got to this, let me get to this like full scroll, if that makes sense. That way I can scroll around from one to the next. What do you see in there? What do we got in there? Already getting some uh, ones here saying they like the part about the LMS, uh, in-house learning, design and development solutions, says uh, tech is listed, it uses key terms. Okay. Um, so we've got some things in there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Now, try again with that same job announcement. You're answering the same questions. Say what you see. Um, is this person writing to the hiring manager? How do you know for that same exact job? Um, does a person align the job announcement with the resume and how do you know? And then put in the chat what it is that you see. What are specific terms that you see? Do you see learning theory? Do you see SME? Do you see, what do you see? What are we seeing in there? All right, we got a couple of them coming in. Easier to read, but it feels like a template. 
this one is better. It uses more keywords from the J job description up front in the summary. Also got other ones like hard to see the resume, much more concise and easy to read. So there's uh, different ones here. Uh, interesting, interesting. Okay, and everything is is a little bit suggest subjective with the hiring managers. Also, I want you to go through this exercise to understand. Put yourself in the shoe of a hiring manager. So whatever you have as your thoughts are absolutely valid. You know, one person may say that first resume that we saw was perfect for the job. Another person may look at the second resume and say, that's the one that I want to pick. All right. So learning some steps and applying them, you're going to build your resume. You're going to craft it. You're going to make sure you have what you need in it. It will work for you. And then that's what I want you to walk away with. It was just some skills of how you need to write your resume. And then you're learning also by this experience, you're starting to mentally already compare, which is what I thought may happen. The first resume that you see here and the second resume that you see here. And what are the differences between those? And like, oh, well, I like the first resume because blah, 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 blah all good and well, or I hate the first resume because blah, 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 because everybody's resume does differ a bit. Same thing here. This one perhaps is more um, grabbing to the eye. Great. This one does have adult learning theory and you could spot it easily. Great. Do you like this one? Fine. Do you not like this one? Also fine. Do what works for you. It's your resume. It's your piece of paper, right? It's your body of work. So whatever does work for you, do that. Just keep in mind, it's the same steps. It's the same processes. Now, how well did this person do in applying that? You can always, you can always discern that for yourself. I think, you know, this person did okay. How would you rate this on a scale of one to 10? Let's just say, of one being a really bad way to write the resume in, and 10 being the best way to write a resume, what would you score this resume as? One being the worst, 10 being the highest, what would you score or rate this resume as responding to this job announcement? And let's just see what everybody says and what everybody compares to. You know, to your point, Rubina, a lot of people have different sort of surveys. And I bet a lot of people here have a survey that either looks closer to the first one or closer mm -hmm. to the second one. Mm -hmm. Now, when you have one, like, should you have like a canned resume, if you will, like for everything and then modify it to the job description? Like, is that okay to, to do? Yeah. So a can, like a standard one that you create and then one where it gets into more specifics. Yeah. So if you were to like, so at some point, just like with LinkedIn, you're going to have like all of your, all of your work in a chronological sort of order. And you're going to have some things that you did and you're going to have like your successes or your, uh, your tools that are just kind of in a particular place, but you want to have them kind of like catalog, no different than LinkedIn. And then based off of the job description, you would just, I guess, take out certain things. So uh, maybe you might have more emphasis on uh, project management or more emphasis on uh, right. e-learning right. development or so forth. Is it okay to have like a, a standard resume that just kind of has the kitchen sink in it? Yeah. So first create a basic instructional design resume for yourself where you're at. Um, based on the job announcements that you're seeing in your market, in your space, the ones that you really want to go to, um, look at several different job announcements. What are they looking at? Because if your resume doesn't talk to what the hiring managers are looking for, it's just not going to get picked up. So make sure you do have the keywords in there that you need in it. And then don't worry so much about... Um, you can curate for specific jobs, for specific announcements. And for, I would say, just to share my experience, perhaps 
40 to 60% of the time that I spend for applying for instructional design jobs, um, especially when I was early on and just trying to get a instructional design job. If I was an entry level instructional designer, I was just applying for lots of stuff because it's like, I don't know what they, they, they are all going to ask for experience. And I'm not sure if I have that much experience, but let me just write down what I have and then just give it out to them. So I had a generic resume for that. Every now and again, when I saw something that really spoke out to me and that fit me really well in the job announcement, then I would just make sure that curtail my resume to make sure that it matched to what they were looking for. And then I'm able to explain that. You don't have to have everything in your resume jam packed. That's where the cover letter comes in. So when it's a really good job, let's say that you really want, there's always gonna be that. There's always gonna be 20 or 30%, you're just gonna apply out there to see what you have. And then there's always gonna be these several, several jobs that are very closely in line with what you wanna do. You wanna work for that company, you wanna work for that project, you wanna do this uh, specific instructional design because it's very meaningful work. Start putting things in the cover letter. Don't forget to put in a cover letter. <laughs> so if it's if it's a job that has uh, a really nice ring to you, that's where you put in that extra bit of information. You can keep your resume generic to go out to all of these different places. And then in your cover letter, specify why you fit this specific what do you got a question coming in? Um, a lot of people say no one reads the cover letter. Your thoughts on that? Nope. Yeah, they do. Yeah, they do. Um, yeah, they do. For the really, it depends what kind of job you're applying for. If you're applying for crapshoot jobs that are about three months contract, no, nobody cares about a cover letter. If you're applying for a six figure salary, instructional design position, and you have about 10 years of work, the expectation changes. Somebody wants to see the cover letter. Somebody definitely wants to see where you align from what they wrote to what you have to offer. So uh, getting back to the uh, unicorn uh, job listing where basically the hiring manager who may or may not have any sort of exposure to instructional design, uh -huh. they are picking out whatever comes out maybe through Google, maybe through their own sort of database. They're probably listing out skill sets that may not even be used, but it feels like they, they'd rather have it than not sort of thing. And it puts the people who are applying in that job in that awkward position of needing to know all these particular tools. For example, I applied for jobs where they wanted you to know, uh, like Captivate, for example, and Storyline. Well, I may have used Captivate years ago, but I've been using Storyline recently sort of thing. To the hiring manager, mm -hmm. they're they're just putting out kind of keywords. What is it, like how can I not feel that level of intimidation with these keywords that I'm worried that they're going to kind of I don't know, catch me if you, I... You you tender the job application. If it looks like crap, you're not going to apply for it. If it <laughs> And that's as simple as that is. It's like looking for a spouse, looking for a partner, looking for a job. It's about the same. If you're presented with a crap job announcement, the company is probably crap. There's a lot going on in there they don't know what they're doing, you may not want that job. Let me tell you, sift through the job, skip it, swipe whatever direction you're supposed to swipe to hit delete and go on to the next job that actually does make sense. Never feel intimidated. The job market is in our, um, um, is in our space, essentially meaning it's kind of like a, what is it in real estate terms, a buyer's market versus a seller's market. We are needed. We are desired. We are wanted. All of these things that people are listing can definitely be negotiated, discussed. You can send an email. You can say, hey, by the way, in your cover letter, I understand that you're looking for Captivate and Storyline. And I've done this. I'm giving you personal firsthand experience that has worked for me. And I still got the interview and I still got the job off. 
this is what happened with me when I have that. I understand your job announcement is saying captivate. Let me write to you how much experience I have in storyline. That is my niche. That is my wheelhouse. You only have to purchase one product, not two. This is the one that I like. I'm certified in both. I'm comfortable with this. I've done it for this many years. Here are my examples. Here's my portfolio. They go, oh, wait, I don't have to buy both. No, you don't. I just saved you money. So hire me and I'll give you your product. I'll give you your instructional design thing, whatever you want. But here's me answering that question. And then I still get the interview and I still get the job. All I've right. done that many times. I've done that many, many times. Never feel intimidated. Never feel confused. All of that stuff is superfluous. Really look with a gleaning and discerning eye at the job announcement. If it doesn't look right, feel right. It probably isn't right for you. If it doesn't say what it needs to say, it you know, don't worry about all of these other super. What about this? What about this? What about this? Never feel like you don't have an equal hand and or perhaps an upper hand because you are talent they need. You can totally walk into that interview. And I did that with my last job. I did that at the state. You can ask my boss. He'll say this. I went in there and I left out. And two minutes before I left out of the interview, here's what happened. I said, wait, so you're saying you want somebody with LMS experience and instructional design to do both LMS and ID work? Yeah. Yeah. Well, do you understand what that means for your timeline? What do you mean? Um, if you want somebody to build a course, plus also put it in the LMS, plus also publish that out, I can probably give you a course every very long time. He goes, I don't want that. I'm like, well, because instructional design is one job. LMS administration is one job. You can definitely hire one person to do both things. And I'm willing to go ahead and do both things. However, I'm more of an instructional designer and that's what I like to do. And that's what I'm really good at. And if you hired another LMS person um, and me as your instructional designer, you're gonna get the timeline that you need. He hired us both. Impressive. Hey, I got a question that just came in. Um, it's in regard to like that skills one you're showing right here. I've heard mixed reviews, including a skills list. I've heard some say that you need it for the ATS, but others say that it takes up room and it doesn't actually show what you can do. They're just words, thoughts, like not talking about tech skills, I assume. I assume they're referring more to like the theory and leadership and other, other sorts of skills that you put on, mm -hmm. on the uh, resume. Uh, I put... So just I'm, I'm, I'm outing myself here. This is mine from a long time ago. I'm not here anymore in, the, in this space. Um, the one that you see on the screen, this one's uh, an old resume of mine. I put in software skills and put in all the software. I put in all of the other instructional design skills and or core competencies and any way you want to put this. Like you can write it in your summary. You can write it in your skills. You can put it on the left-hand side. You've got to have these key terms in your resume for it to get through through the cycle. After that, you can then go into your work and your education and your publications and all of the other stuff that you want to put in here. The next employer has to know what it is you can do for them, what it is you're capable of doing for them and what it is that you have to offer. So you've got to have these things in here. And if anybody tells you different, I'll eat my hat. That's not typically how it goes. And honestly, these are negotiating points for me to get a higher salary. So you can say whatever you want, but what this affords me is the higher salary at the negotiation table. Do you have thoughts about, like as we looked at the two um, resumes there, um, about like being able to read it? Like, you know, how, how we look at things the way that, you know, we may want to design a course. We're talking about negative space. We're talking about like mm -hmm. readability sort of things. Um, and I see this with other people who are like adamant about like having a two pager. Like I've been told that like, don't have anything bigger than a two pager. If you have old work or whatnot, at some point you need to cut it off. Just kind of maintain that, that um, enough that you could do a front and back copy. 
what are your thoughts about like trying to maximize the words relative to, I guess, readability? Awesome. Awesome. Very good question. And I'll leave off with this. And this has hopefully been a very good discussion for you guys. And again, I'm sharing my personal experiences with you. You're going to have your own and we'll meet together after this and we can we can talk about it and stuff like that, too. Um, I do hope that that this was meaningful and helpful for you for, for what I was able to present. Um, that I look at the blank canvas of the resume just as I look at a blank canvas of a storyline, articulate storyline. And then I use my real estate. You get templates and storyline, right? And correct me if I'm wrong, sometimes you can't fit in your content into the template and then it just sucks. Like you start playing around with the real estate on the page. Do I need 1.0 whatever margins on my resume? No, go ahead, make it eight. Who cares? It's your resume. Make sure it prints. Don't go off too far. Like you like have 0.0 whatever. Um, the minimum is 0.5. The maximum is is point is 1.0. Work with that. Use your real estate. Use your resume. Look at a beautiful templates that you see, modern templates that you see. There's lots of better resumes. I mean, this one is about three or four years old. Now people are putting in resumes where they have their skills and they say how good they are with some of those skills and core competencies. That's great to put in. Um, those are modern looking resumes and stuff because you're trying to capture the visual attention of the hiring manager. So you want to make sure that it is laid out presentably after you do this. So this is like step one. And then step two is what I call, and I, and I, I share this with Q when we were talking about it before, there's like a gold, silver and bronze way to format your resume. And I'll share that with you guys. I just don't have that up with me right now. The top part of your resume, that first third of your resume is the gold section. Write whatever you need to write in there, in that top part section um, that presents it really nicely and well, your name, your role, your skills, essentially your skills. Nine times out of 10, it's going to be your skills um, and your core competencies. The silver part is going to be your work history. What have you done? Where have you applied those core competency skills? Just so that we have an idea that you did do some of that work. And then at the end is your bronze level of like your education, if you need to put that in your service, if you need to put it in any other small projects and stuff, it's a gold, silver, bronze format. I'll be publishing that in, in, in another week's time. Just check back with me on LinkedIn or something like that. I will publish that out so that you could see that as a template model. And I understand there's still stuff on the left-hand side of resumes. They've gotten really pretty now. Um, those are also in your gold section because visually you're capturing the attention of the hiring manager when you do that. So you definitely want to capture it visually the exact same way when you make a course. You want it to be visually engaging. You want to have white space work in favor for you, but you also need to say what you need to say. And so if you need to use the real estate in order for you to do that, do it. I hope this was really good and really helpful and gave you guys some things to think about. Um, this is your step one. And then for our follow-up, if we need to follow up and talk about things in more detail, talk about your specific um, job experience and your specific uh, confines and whatever. Um, let's do it. Let's absolutely do it. I'm happy to meet with anybody um, uh, at the tables after this. And if you can't meet today, um, hit me up on Calendly. I have some um, like time on there. Absolutely. It's always open for you guys. Um, and we can we can set up a time to talk and, and get into more detail.